The Psalter reading today is from Psalm 15. It's read from the New Revised Standard Version. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right, and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Well, our second scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. It's a familiar passage to many of us. It's the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, It's called the Beatitudes many times. And uh, uh, this passage, uh, this entire sermon, represents teachings that Jesus would have given in a number of different contexts throughout Israel as he traveled and shared the word of God. Um, But on this particular occasion, he was giving uh, the message on an elevated area, a mount. And we read beginning in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. O God, in this dark world, filled with so much uncertainty, we thank you for your presence, and we thank you for your word that shines a bright light on the path that you have carved out for us. Bless us as we seek your word today. Fill us with wisdom, with comfort, with peace. Whatever we're experiencing right now, God, give us what we need to follow your will for our lives and experience meaning and purpose in all things, even the challenges we experience. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a young boy settled down with his kindergarten class to color in their coloring books. But he realized he didn't have any crayons. Miss Teacher, the boy said, I ain't got no crayons. Well, the teacher looked at him sternly, and she replied, What you mean is, I don't have any crayons. You don't have any crayons. We don't have any crayons. They don't have any crayons. Do you see what I'm getting at? Not really, the little boy answered. What happened to all them crayons? (laughs) Well, some situations in life can feel hopeless 
for teachers and for students uh, and for everyone at times. But uh, though hopelessness can happen to anyone, it doesn't have to linger indefinitely in our lives. In fact, identifying it is the first step that we can take on a journey that leads us right out of it by inspiring us to bring it to Jesus, whose teachings and living spirit can transform the despair that we're feeling into hope. And we know that Christ can do this because it's, in fact, precisely what he did 2,000 years ago in his own life, in other people's lives, in first century Israel. He transformed despair into hope. And our scripture readings today speak to how specifically he did that. And a lot of those specifics had to do with the world that Jesus was born into. See, all of us were born into different situations in life. And all of these life situations, the, the family we're born into, the neighborhood that we live in, all these other things, they challenge us in different ways. I've mentioned before many times that, you know, we know we're all going through the same challenge right now together in the form of this unprecedented worldwide pandemic. Uh, but when we talk about the challenges that Christ suffered and overcame in this world, we oftentimes focus upon Jesus' suffering on the cross, his crucifixion, because that was indeed a huge, horrific price that Christ paid for us. And it was a challenge he overcame when he rose again. The cross is central to our faith as Christians, central to our salvation. But it's also important for us to understand that Jesus demonstrated that same spirit of facing challenges and overcoming them throughout his whole life, Scripture teaches us. And Jesus was born into and lived his whole life along with others in his society under circumstances that most people would consider, quite bluntly, a living hell. Yet time and again, without fail, Jesus transformed despair into hope. And that culminated on the cross, but he did it throughout his life. Our Lord's society, it was a broken society. And it was filled with disheartened and demoralized people. Uh, it was a situation that literally squeezed the life out of people, crushing many people every day. But even amid a complete mess like this, our Lord didn't back down. When he was knocked down, he wouldn't stay down. He simply wouldn't quit on the cross. But in every other situation he experienced that we read about in the Gospels as well. And so in this way, it helps us understand uh, the way Jesus speaks to us through Scripture. Jesus was less like Clint Eastwood, for example, who in those westerns, you know, boldly rode into town on a well-watered steed. You know, he took out all the bad guys in a single fight and then rode away into the sunset victorious, brushing the dust off his coat that had gotten a little ruffled during the commotion. Uh, Jesus was less like that. And instead, he was more like that uh, Irish boxer James J. Braddock. You know, the boxer played by uh, Russell Crowe in that movie Cinderella Man, who uh, even though he experienced poverty 
physical injury, emotional abuse, and, and hunger during the Great Depression, he still simply would not back down. He bravely stood up time and again fighting against strong opponents. You know, Russell Crowe was really good in that movie. You know, I liked him in uh, Gladiator as well. And, and I learned something new about the ancient Romans uh, from his portrayal of General Maximus in Gladiator. I learned that um, ancient Roman generals spoke with a British accent. I didn't know that, but uh, after I saw that movie, you know, but um, uh, Jesus was more like James J. Braddock. I mean, of course, he didn't punch anybody in the face during his ministry, so there's that, but he nonetheless confronted hopelessness straight on in different ways, over and over again, teaching people in the process that God can transform any kind of despair into hope. Now, what is it that made Jesus' society such a difficult place in which to live? Well, you see, up until a century and a half before Jesus was born, his homeland, Israel, had been occupied for more than 400 years by one oppressive power after another. The most recent uh, was the Greeks, you know, who ruled tyrannically over the region for 170 years. But when a Greek ruler made the dumb decision to outlaw the practice of the Jewish faith itself, well, the Hebrew people decided that they'd had it with the Greeks. That was it. And 142 years before Jesus was born, a group of Jewish rebels called the Maccabees overthrew Greek rule using what we call today guerrilla warfare. Um, they freed the southern part of Israel including Jerusalem, to live as an independent Jewish kingdom for the first time since 586 B.C., when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon destroyed it. This, this is the first time that the Israelites had been free. They'd been in bondage for generations, for centuries, but 142 years before Christ's birth, they were finally free. Most people didn't even understand what it meant to live free. And this inspired among them all sorts of discussion about a coming Messiah, a descendant of a great Jewish king, David, who reigned a thousand years earlier, who would rise up from among them and restore the kingdom of Israel to its former glory. And for 80 years... They lived like this, free and hopeful that at any moment God's anointed representative would appear and would build God's kingdom on earth. But you know what happened instead? 63 years before Jesus was born, the Romans showed up. And, uh, well, they weren't the Messiah. Let's put it that way. Uh, Caesar didn't usher in a golden Israelite age, but instead he put the Jewish people who had tasted freedom for 80 years, he put them back into bondage. Now imagine the discouragement, the dismay, the hopelessness that the Israelites must have felt. Now they heard about bondage as something that their great-grandparents had experienced, but that was something in the past. They now were free until it happened again. And many probably began to question whether God had abandoned them. So groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that had developed during those years of freedom they tried to keep the people hopeful by telling them, don't worry, the Messiah is still coming. 
The Romans won't keep us in bondage for another 400 years. Believe me, they'll be gone before we know it. The Messiah is coming. But even as they preached this message, the Pharisees throughout the countryside, Israelite farmers were losing their land. People were being taxed at obscene levels. Valuable natural resources were being stolen by the Romans. And Jewish men, women, and children were, were being forced into harsh lives of servitude. A recent um, study of, of Roman documents at the time also revealed that Israelite children were being systematically sexually abused and there was nothing any Israelite could do about any of this. The light of hope that was left in people's hearts was growing dimmer. 37 years before Jesus was born. This was all happening and the Jewish people revolted violently against the Romans. But unlike with the Greeks, they were brutally defeated by the Romans. And afterwards the Romans installed a local Jewish puppet king named Herod who was determined that no Jew even think of messing with the Romans again. And that's the way Herod ruled with an iron fist. And this is what Jesus was born into and grew up in. Remember, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. And we've talked before about uh, archaeological evidence uncovered that revealed the existence of a large encampment um, of military, Roman military soldiers living right near the town. In other words, this small rural town of 500 defenseless Jewish men, women, and children with no rights as we understand them today. We're living beside an encampment of enemy soldiers. And we can imagine the harassment and abuse that people in Jesus' community, that Jesus himself regularly experienced. You now these soldiers could do anything they wanted to to the people in Nazareth. And Jesus experienced it without a father for many years because Joseph, most scholars believe, died when Jesus was young. And all this trauma that, that went along with this would have been enough to make many people give up and many people did give up. But Jesus, God in flesh, didn't give up. As soon as he was old enough to ensure his mother, his single mother, would be cared for, he began preparing to turn things around in a way that no one expected. He spent time apart from society in a desolate region with a harsh climate with few resources because it was unlikely that the Romans would be in that area. It was a cruddy place to live. So he went out into the wilderness, it's called in scripture, um, and he gathered his thoughts. Some in that region, like John the Baptist, recognized him for the leader he was and uh, baptized him and celebrated who he was. But there was no large, large crowd of supporters who followed him out of those harsh conditions back into society when he began his public ministry. Instead, alone, at 30 years old, uh, he began gathering a group of followers who would carry on his ministry after his death, a death he knew he would experience sooner or later because he knew the message he was going to bring. 
And after gathering these followers, he began traveling from rural town to rural town in northern Israel, working miracles in people's lives and teaching them about a kingdom of heaven that they could live in even while occupied by the Romans. This was radical to people's thinking. It was a spirit-filled way of living and being that could accomplish more than the violent overthrow of the latest world power to dominate them, but instead it would transform people from the inside out and the nature of society itself, giving all who believed the promise of eternal life. It was a tent of God's grace, as the psalmist put it today in the the, uh, passage that Marilyn read for us, that was big enough for everyone to abide in. Salvation didn't come from a movement of some kind that, that had to exist that might overthrow the current situation or change it. It became a personal decision that every person made and could receive simply through faith. But along the way, Jesus was mistreated. He was harassed continuously. He was mocked and belittled. He was physically threatened and he was physically abused. All while many in his audience cried out, we're poor, we're broken, we're weak and are persecuted by these people who came in and were simply trying to live peaceful lives and they're taking everything from us. Where can any of us possibly find hope? in any of this. But Jesus kept going all the way to the cross, teaching time and again along the way in different contexts, something that just didn't seem to make sense uh, to people right when they first heard it. But something as they began to understand his message was true. It was so true that blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Uh, These people living under this oppression, this was an evidence that God had left them. It was an evidence that God had cursed them. Instead, it created an opportunity for them to understand that they could receive God's grace regardless of what was going on around them. And it's because the, w- the way that Jesus lived his whole life with this message that we know that when we feel hopeless in life, We can bring our concerns to him. He who healed, taught, and rose from the dead even after experiencing what he did. Jesus' teachings remind us and his life itself demonstrates time and again that there is something that neither tyrants, pain, poverty, hunger, injustice, pandemics, uh, economic issues, nothing. There's something that, that, that none of these things can ever take for many of us. And that's the hope of living in God's kingdom, which begins right here on earth and continues into eternity. You know, if life ever begins to cause us to despair, that hopelessness doesn't have to last for this reason. Because if we, like Jesus, persist in our faith in all things, if we bring our concerns to him in everything and never give up, his spirit will carry us through this life into eternity and will bring others along with us as they see and are inspired by our fortitude. Everything, therefore, about Jesus and his life, he challenges us to ask ourselves every moment, am I willing to follow his example 
in all things. That's a choice each of us can make. And if our answer is yes, well then, we'll always have hope. Amen.